Hare Krishna, Bhaktivinoda Maharaj. Thank you very much for joining today for the Monk's podcast. Hare Krishna, it's my great pleasure to be here with you. A very seasoned uh, uh, interviewer and a very seasoned uh, person who has got a wide range of uh, information, knowledge, and a very good uh, writer, maybe uh, one of the best I've seen in Ascon. Oh. So I'm very happy to be here with you, Thank trying you to share a few thoughts. Thank you for those kind words. I have not yeah. had much interactions with you, but whenever I have heard your classes within Mayapur or in Perth or other places, I can see scholarship, practicality, as well as uh, serious spirituality all coming together in your classes. And during our personal interactions, your warmth, your depth, and also the breadth of your vision, especially I talk with so many devotees that when we met in Perth, you told me how I think, was, was it in uh, New Orleans? You were there and you had to give the Sunday feast, but you said that uh, there were many Western people uh -huh, outside, okay. and you decided not to give the Sunday feast, but you decided to just sit and talk with people. So Yes, yes. That is amazing. So you're concerned more with reaching out to people whom we can't normally reach out to, not just yeah. giving classes. So, so Maharaj, today, I'll say, been, yeah, please. You're saying something, Maharaj? Yeah. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, my desire to actually explore new venues of outreach and preaching, especially when I travel outside of India. So that's the experience I think I related to you. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. I said that's the last we met, I think, in Perth. Yes, yes, that's true. Okay. Yes, Maharaj. So it's nice to see you again here on this virtual yes. uh, arrangement. <laughs> So Maharaj, today I was thinking we could discuss broadly about outreach. Maybe we could start with India, since uh, both of us are from India and now we are also considering traveling and reaching out to the broader world. But can you share about how your outreach started in India and how it has expanded your experience in leading outreach in India over the years? Well, uh, it's a long checkered history, actually. My uh, interest in outreach uh, peaked to quite some extent in uh, at the times when in India, the preaching took a different turn. Uh, mostly, I was saddled with a lot of regular institutional responsibilities and I was eking out my preaching living, I should say, oh. uh, by making small sorties into areas that I like very much to do. You have always been in Coimbatore, Maharaj, or you have been with various places? I have been traveling quite a bit all over no, south but, and all. Okay, but your base? I've not been much to the north of India so much, okay. but except for places, uh, I mean, when I go for some other meetings or some things, but. I do travel outside of India and uh, okay. I've been traveling in south of India. Coimbatore? Your base has always I have got one sort of a base in Coimbatore in Tamil Nadu and also in Kerala. Oh, okay. Uh, that way, Kerala is a very challenging and interesting place to perform outreach. Yeah, I've uh, heard about it. It's, it's yeah, it's a, it's, it's a part puri of people who are communists, the only other communist state in India apart from West Bengal. Yeah. And uh, the, mo the most highly literate state in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have uh, a wide variety of uh, mix of religions, yeah. very strong Christian community and uh, very strong Hindu community that is mostly impersonalists and Mayavadis and descendants oh. of Shankaracharya. Then you have a quite a strong Muslim community. In fact, the Hindus are slowly turning out to be like 
a minority very soon, maybe. Uh, so it's a very interesting place. It's a, uh, interesting is a euphemism, probably. Interesting. Yeah, it's got the highest highest suicide rates in India, oh. and the biggest guzzlers of alcohol, and uh, I think some of the biggest consumers of meat. Uh, and you have a whole lot of uh, mix of things. So it's I thought Bangalore was the suicide capital. Maybe Bangalore might be as a city, but as a state, it might be Kerala. Yeah, I addressed a whole uh, suicide, uh, what do you call a workshop and a seminar once. Okay. And there I was shown the uh, whole statistics showing how Kerala is the number one state in suicide rate. So many things like that. Of course, your question was uh, Indian outreach. What I remember from the history is that uh, much of India was, I think, uh, struggling a bit to express itself in terms of ISKCON's teachings. Mm. Uh, and I think things started changing a bit when uh, these big temples came up. Especially in Bangalore, we had this Hare Krishna hill come up. Hmm. Uh, and before that itself, preaching started, uh, a few years before that, preaching started taking an upturn. This was 1990? Somewhere on, I think the, uh, that temple was inaugurated somewhere in 1997 or 1996. And you were introduced to Shankar Maharaj? I was... I was initiated into ISKCON in 1983. 83, oh. And uh, we were the first group of uh, devotees coming together to the Bombay temple. Oh. I was maybe working in uh, briefly, my brief stint in Bombay. At that time, we were visiting the Juhu temple, along with a few other students from IIT Mumbai. And uh, we were just visiting. So uh, there was my the friends. Was it there? No, he was, he was later? the next batch. He was the next, next batch. batch. This was oh, okay. uh, other personalities. And uh, that's how I got introduced to ISKCON. And I found it very fascinating. The type of uh, the temple and the ambience and the atmosphere and the kirtan and it looked very different from a regular traditional temple that I've been to. Also, so it was so that's how my... Uh, yeah. It was more the ambience than the philosophy that attracted you? Well, I got attracted to the philosophy first, but I'm saying this was the first impact to see something very different. Okay. And then uh, I remember Sridhar Maharaj would call us and give us some goodies, nice prasadam, and give us a big, huge TV screen to watch videos of Prabhupada. And all that attracted me. It was, you know, a different experience. And that's how my first experience started was to Juhu Temple. Mm. And then after that, I was back in South India. So and, you are uh, from South India? So I am originally from South India. I'm from Tamil Nadu. Okay. I am a Tamil speaking, but uh, in Kerala, they call us, uh, you know, Ayers, Tamil speaking Palagad Ayers. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that so, means some amount of spirituality must have been in your family also, isn't it? I am from a Smarta Brahmin family. Okay. Yes. So quite pious and religious and all the puja and all that stuff going on at home regularly. Uh, more oriented towards uh, Smarta Brahmin type of atmosphere. Yes. Yeah. So for me... Vaishnavism was a very different type of a discovery. Okay. But however, uh, like you said, preaching in India took a turn that I actually witnessed and there were good models coming up. One was the model coming up in Chaupadi that they had a class preaching. I understood that from Chaitanya Charita Amrita in many places that there are two types of preaching. One is class and one is mass. Hmm. I think Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement, as I understand, is a mass movement. And in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada mentions that Nityananda Prabhu, he did the mass preaching. 
Mm. And Lord Chaitanya himself took it upon himself to do the class preaching. He, you know, gave that information to Rupa Goswami, to Sanatan Goswami, to Sarvam Bhattacharya. Mm. And he had this class preaching that he handled himself. And uh, we understand, as I understand, I think that uh, our preaching is broadly classified into mass and class. But I would say our movement is a class. I mean, uh, our movement is a mass movement. Mm. And maybe the class uh, of people are expected to mastermind it, uh, think about how to spread it among the mass of people. That's how Lord Chaitanya planned uh, the whole thing. So I would say that uh, a lot of the preaching that was going on in India was mass preaching. And we were able to affect those type of people who were not like uh, much, uh, what should I say, exposed to some of the fine philosophical content of our scriptural studies. But the more we carried on into colleges and to intellectual people and others, gradually our preaching changed a lot. Mm. Yes, Just the mind take on it. Yes, ma'am. This class gentle take on it. Yes, ma'am. That's true. And this class and mass is quite a uh, prominent feature of Lord Chaitanya's outreach and Prabhupada's purpose also. I thought a metaphor for this. It's something like in spirituality there is philosophy and there is culture. So I sometimes compare this to be to like science and technology. So technology is widely used by people. So almost everybody uses the internet now, but not many people know how the internet works. What is the technique? What is the science behind it? And as long as the internet is working, then we don't even need the scientists in a sense. But when it stops yeah. working, that's when the scientists become very important. So philosophy, sorry, culture is like technology. That means if the culture is going on, people have a tradition, people have a culture of visiting the temples and practicing, practicing and celebrating festivals. It goes on. But as modernity started spreading, people started questioning the culture more and more. And that's where the need for philosophy comes up. Now, why should we do this? And then that's where we actually need, need thoughtful people. As you said, class. We need to preach to classes and then the classes can actually uh, take the message forward. You see that Prabhu, when Prabhupada was preaching in India, he got, uh, we could say that he got a significant number of like members and they were very pious and sometimes very, uh, very generous in their contributions, but not many of them were uh, very philosophical. So that in fact, uh, what attracted me to Krishna consciousness was the philosophy. I had never seen such systematic philosophical answers. And exactly. Uh, yeah. And you know, if, but we ourselves, if we, if we have not focused on that strength, you know, when we build the temples and then people started coming and then we started having philosophical education being provided. That's how we were able to reach the classes. And I think that is Iskon's distinct strength. Now we have philosophy and that gives a rationale for the culture. So without that, the culture starts getting, starts dwindling or starts getting rejected or even derided. So any thoughts on this metaphor or any? Well, that's a nice analogy you gave uh, about technology and science. Uh, in one sense, uh, science, to the flip side of it is science is, uh, you know, not made much progress, uh, but technology has made a lot of progress. <laughs> uh, that is so true. in the same way, uh, a philosophy, some, some, you know, got, took a back burner uh, and the, you know, culture aspect of it, because if you look into India, I gave some time back, I gave a session for tourism students in Kerala. And when I asked them to define how do you market Kerala, they spoke about Bardhanatyam, they spoke about uh, architecture of the temples, they spoke about 
this and that, and they didn't speak anything about philosophy and spirituality, uh, you know. And then I had to introduce basic philosophy right from I'm not the body and Bhagavad Gita and uh, stuff like that. And I told them this is real wealth and it is yeah. marketable. Uh, so it's something like that, uh, you know. So I think yeah, ISKCON just, provided just a this point. great... Sorry. Yeah, ISKCON contributed to a great extent to explaining to the wider, <coughs> you know, religious people, <coughs> especially the Hindus, mm -hmm. Christians and Muslims and others also, that uh, there is a foundational, wonderful premise philosophical premise to yeah. why we believe in God and uh, who is that God? Who are we? What are these interrelationships? And where do we live this world? This sort of a tripartite relationship between God, man, and the world we live in. That's a great contribution of Prabhupada. And that I think uh, is very interesting to many as a fundamental understanding of a philosophy of religion. Mm, that's beautiful. That I think was very interesting for many. Yes, Maharaj. This one point before I would like to explore, respond what you're saying. You know, there was, I read about some survey in America about what is people's perception of India. So they for often, they, they think of yoga. They think of, uh, yeah. when it was asked, what is, your idea of literature or wisdom from India. So it was not the Bhagavad Gita. It was not even the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. It was the Kama Sutra. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. So, you know, somehow the wisdom aspect, India is yes. seen as a land of spirituality, no doubt. But still the, liter the wisdom aspect is not stressed even in the international vision of India. What to speak of Indian vision itself. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Also, you made this example uh, tripod. That's interesting. So, I think this is 13th chapter that is Jiva, Ishwar, and Prakriti. So, you're saying that the relationship between the three is what our philosophy provides. Yeah, basically, the Bhagavad Gita philosophy is about who are you, who is God, what is this world, and what are the interrelationships. But, uh, you know, the self, about God and about the world we live in. And of course, there are other things like the other world, the spiritual situation, etc. Mm. But these are foundational aspects of inquiry of reality. Yes, that is Which true. almost all religions are supposed to answer. Uh, and uh, the Vedic literature has got that rich wealth. But somehow you see, like you said, that uh, they practice say, the cultural portion of it and it has become so ritualistic. And uh, it has led to other things like casteism and uh, other types of uh, you know, repercussions from not having a practice based on a foundation philosophy. Right? Wow. Over a period of time, it has you know, become that way. And I think Iskorn's contribution, Prabhupada's contribution is that uh, reawakening everybody to the foundational, fundamental understanding of reality, the philosophy of reality. Yes, Maharaj. Yeah. This is, uh, so considering the history of our movement, as you said, of our outreach specifically, uh, this philosophy, which, when, so you're saying that when we started stressing the philosophy in our outreach, we also started attracting a particular class of people. Yeah. And that's how uh, we could say that our outreach, we could say that it, it grew like a geometric progression because we attracted people who themselves could teach it to others. Exactly. Yeah. I think especially with all the youth programs like you have started in yourself and Radhe Sham and Pune, we yeah. attracted a little intelligent class of people students especially who started examining the philosophy and mm -hmm. considering it to be very interesting because it gave them explanations scientifically about many things yeah. that they always wanted to know in the back of their mind they always had these questions and they were answered so i think that was like the turning point 
uh, when preaching took off in a different way. That's interesting. I was also thinking from a sociological perspective, uh, India started moving towards the middle class started bargaining from the 1990s onwards. Now India had the liberalization and if you look at the sheer number of people in the middle class, they have grown enormously. And uh, in, since 1990s, it's almost like a 200 or 300% growth in the number of people in the middle class. So, and if we see many of the people who do come to our moment, we have always had people who are life patterns and the people who are business people. But when we start, most educated people go into something like software and other competitive fields and could a certain level of say material prosperity also leads to a different kind of problems where people start feeling a need for spirituality as we present it. So at one answer we are where there are educated there are educated answers to questions. There is also a space where there is systematic spiritual practice. So, and then there is, we have a sadhana, we have regulated worship. So in a sense, uh, could it be that say our disciplined approach to spirituality appealed also to people who themselves you know, to, to be successful in the competitive world of India in any career, People also need a certain level of discipline. So could it be that that also contributed in the broader sociological context of India? Uh, yes, I think, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's an interesting point. Because most of uh, India's uh, history, especially Hinduism, is a little dabbling of it on, uh, you know, temple visits and rituals and... Uh, whole sorts of uh, performances that did not go very deep. That didn't really go very deep. And Sorry, like you said what, that... What didn't go very deep? Uh, because I said that it didn't go deep into philosophy, most of... Okay. Uh, in, in many places, in common following, in the mass following, I mean. Mm -hmm. People who were mostly uh, thinking it to be a ritualistic performance going to temples, attending festivals, observing certain vows uh, and expecting some results for their betterment in their life, etc. Mm -hmm. But uh, we came in with a whole, like you said, a disciplined, a practical performance, sadhana, mm -hmm. and putting into practice the understanding and the philosophy. And we actually gave an experience an experience of practice of the philosophy. Like there's a famous quote of Prabhupada saying, philosophy is good, great, but greater than philosophy is the practice of philosophy. Mm. And I think that sums up his whole, you know, crafting of the movement and the philosophy and the practice of it, finally giving us an experience. So I think that attracted many here is a philosophy that works. And here is a philosophy that explains many things I always wanted to know. And this is a discipline. And if we perform that in a particular way, we have an experience. And that experience sort of takes us closer to a, our understanding of a reality. And in this way, it, become, it became like a possible way of satisfying your queries uh, by a practice, and getting an experience. Yes. So I think that is interesting. Prabhupada has not given us a process that is only philosophy heavy or philosophy intensive. Mm. He's also given us a practice of it, which you have described very nicely as sadhana. Mm. And then he has also given us a goal, which we can move towards using the practice and the philosophy, or which is like the end of the uh, you know, practice. It leads us to an experience which is promised. Yes, that's true. So all this is like a nice system. And in, mo in this world, mostly people achieve success through all these type of models. You have your life, you work hard, you study hard, you, then you get a good job, you work it up, and then you climb up the ladder of your success, and then 
you're able to amass money and then you have assets and properties and then you experience good life. That model is there in people's head. And I think there's a similar model offered by Prabhupada's movement in yeah, terms of spiritual life and experience. You know, there is, uh, since you brought this idea of a model, I thought of, uh, I was going to bring this up later, but the broadly I thought about the interaction between spiritual life and material life in three distinct ways. One is rejection, second is complementation, and third is improvement. That material life is temporary, you reject it and practice spiritual life. Second is material life is fine, but if you want meaning, if you want fulfillment, you need to have spiritual life. And thirdly, is your spiritual life will improve your material life. So rejection, complementation and improvement. So ISKCON traditionally operated in the first model only. And Prabhupada's initial disciples, if you see in America, they just they had already rejected material life and they took up spiritual life. And most of popular spirituality is in this third, third area. They, all those leaders who are known as big spiritual leaders, they basically tell how you can succeed more, how you can have better relationships. There is yoga for health, even there is yoga for better sex, which is of yes. course very gross. But, <laughs> but the idea is that, you know, we as a movement started with this model, that rejection. And that was a bit too much for Indians to accept. So when Prabhupada came back to India, there's a lot of appreciation of Prabhupada as the guru of Westerners and a lot of people supported Prabhupada, but actually very few, if any, actually became committed followers. So it was, if we, my understand, my thinking is that it was more of a, uh, a nationalistic cultural pride than a spiritual commitment. Mm. And possibly because, because, you know, our first generation's ethos was that you know, to become a devotee means you reject your life and you come to move into the temple and none of the life members who already had their lives and careers and families, they're likely to give that up. So then over the years, probably we also have we could say moved from the rejection to the complementation model to some extent. Uh, wherein, yes, so of course, I would say, I, I would like your comments on this. So to some extent, we had a significant explosion in the Brahmachari ashram, which we could say is a manifestation of the rejection model. But then we also have had a significant uh, spreading in the congregation also. And even some of our say anti-material rhetoric, anti-grahastha rhetoric, anti-material rhetoric, I'm seeing in the last maybe decade, it has been toned down. So and now this is with respect to practice, but even ideologically, I, my understanding is that initially we were quite critical of every form of spirituality other than Krishna consciousness. There were devotees who even, I, I remember, I was told that there were devotees who even went and challenged Madhva Vaishnavas, why don't you accept Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? And we just were maybe too exclusivist. And almost all the leaders in our movement, because the first generation leaders who have become significantly successful, uh, they are not that confrontational in their approach. They give due, due deference to the existing culture and the existing practices. And they encourage people to build on that. Any thoughts on this, Maharaj? Oh, very interesting observation. Well, uh, I would say that, like you said, initially the rejection model, mm. uh, maybe that's the type of model that could have been easily workable in a place like America at that point of time uh, mm. in the history when there were a lot of uh, dissatisfied, dissentient youth and yeah. there was a lot of, uh, you know, what do you call confusion in their lives. So they, Prabhupada offered an alternative life and uh, he was willing to accommodate them. 
And somehow it so happened that they were able to easily reject and come because also in the West, they don't have much of a family structure, a cultural background structure, etc. So they could take that leap because mm -hmm. they had nothing to lose as such. But that same model, like you said, when it came to India, Prabhupada was very much aware of it. Uh, he uh, was, you know, like you said, not so, was not so easily able to get people to join him full. And he was not marketing that either. He knew that in India, there was a very strong cultural background. There was a family structure and people were very safe. They had all the emotional requirements nicely catered to. They had security. They had this whole cultural family background stuff going on. So they wouldn't really give up that so easily and come up unless they had some special situation wherein uh, it was necessary for them to, you know, jump in and experience something different. So I think only those type of people who were either philosophically inclined or they found it very fascinating or didn't have so much of a family background, et cetera, et cetera, where the people in India who would have opted to have joined Prabhupada fully. That's why I think the Indian people coming and joining full time was very less. It was not uh, so prevalent. But then the model in India, uh, Prabhupada's Krishna conscious model in India slowly became uh, nicely fused in with the cultural structure. And that's when the congregational preaching took off very nicely. And hats off to some of our leaders who boldly stepped into the congregation. You'll be very surprised to know that when I got initiated, I was told by one disciple of Prabhupada, if you're not going to join full time, there's no need to get initiated. You can just uh, chant Hare Krishna and uh, be the way you are. You're a you know, nice uh, person and you're interested in Krishna consciousness. Because if you, init if you get initiated, you must actually join full time. It really stuck in my head. And this was the type of uh, instruction that was being given at those times. Like you're right. I just want to reflect your thought on it. Yeah. Uh, but those was the early days. Uh, and it didn't fly very well with most people. So when I joined the movement, like I was like one of the few who made a very bold decision to get off from a nice family because I am from a large family. I have five brothers and two, I have five sisters and two brothers. <laughs> We are eight of us. My God. Uh, so for me to make the change was like a, internally also sometimes a little difficult. Uh, but I was excited about the philosophy of Krishna consciousness and I wanted to give my life a proper movement. But I had to settle and patch up a lot of things. So that's why I'm saying the question that you have raised is something that I have experienced. Uh, I took a very bold jump. I was in a very good job, uh, you know, I was a design engineer in a very you know, uh, big company and uh, I was drawing some good amount and everything was fine and somehow I got attracted to the philosophy and I made this jump. Of course, I didn't turn back after that. Uh, but what you said is very, very relevant. You see, Prabhupada's mandate to come back to something more foundation. Prabhupada's mandate given to him by his guru was to preach in the Western world. It was very interesting. Yes. So Prabhupada was all the time concerned about going to the Western world outside of India to preach. He did start the movement in India, officially registered at League of Nature, you know, League of Devotees and everything. But it really didn't take off. Yeah, and he, he was he had this in his uh, you know heart, and he made his final historical journey to the West, and then it took off. And he was very grateful to the devotees in the West, especially in America, uh, those first people who came and helped him immensely mm -hmm. to spread the movement and everything together. So and then he came to India with that. He spoke about bringing his dancing white elephants and attracting the Indian people. So he had a totally different strategy 
when he came back to India after his trip to the West, he had a much greater experience of how to market Krishna consciousness in a different domain. Mm. And he came with a greater experience to India and he had his uh, uh, devotees from America preach openly in the stage and everything. And the Indians got really attracted. It really, he, he really attracted. So his mandate was Western preaching. So quite often when we have these discussions about how India has, has got a very huge chunk of the preaching all over the world. I know once a GBC chairman in our national meeting said, uh, you know, 80% of the preaching in the world goes on in India. Mm. In terms of temples, in terms of devotees, uh, in terms of festivals, in terms of, you know, properties and you name it. Because it is the culture of the land. And the Prabhupada said it's like a huge elephant. Uh, you know, Prabhupada used the word that India is a dead elephant. But it's still useful. Because you can take the tusk, you can take that, you can take this and use it. Yeah. Uh, so in one sense, the mandate was Western preaching. Quite often, I think that India preaching is easy. Outreach is easy in India. Because people can instantly relate to it. They just get the philosophical portion of it straight and they can immediately understand the rest of it because of the cultural background that still exists. That's true. So in India, the results can come lying down. People donate to you. People donate monies, properties, and they are very excited about the festivals you have. They're very excited about ISKCON temples and they wholeheartedly support. So I would say that uh, we have awakened a sleeping giant and uh, it's coming on very nicely and so we don't really need to put creative effort like Prabhupada did when he went to the West to actually pitch the whole outreach. It comes in naturally. So in India, the success is quite natural. Mm. But I would say that sometimes when you make this comparison between India and the West, and we say that uh, we are in the West, we are not able to really preach to the locals, to Westerners, and we are going for the low-hanging fruits. The yeah. Indians are the ones who are coming in easily and uh, making up the bulk of the congregation and the outreach and everything. I think in India also we are going for the low-hanging fruit because we are not employing any particular strategy or anything, which if we did, maybe we will get much better results in terms of the class of people and the mass that we can reach. Uh, we are taking it lying down sometimes. If you employ a little bit of strategy, which we have done in certain places, like you have done with the youth in Pune and uh, you know, with the class congregation you have in Chaupadi and uh, some other places here and there. I think that we will reach mass and class in a more strategic way. But coming back to the point that the mandate of Prabhupada is to preach in the, uh, given to Prabhupada is to preach in the Western world. Mm. I would think that as an Indian sannyasi, when I travel to the West, my, my mind is always working on this because when I go to the West, I get to preach to a lot of Indians in the congregation. That's true. And I always thought that, am I coming so far away just to preach to the uh, you know, Indians? So would I like to actually have the taste of preaching to the locals? I mean, the Westerners, which is something that I was very interested in doing. But over a period of time, I understood that the whole uh, Indian Yatra should also technically and uh, what do you call uh, otherwise back up the Western preaching because that is a mandate of Prabhupada. Yes. He wanted to preach all over the world, carry Krishna consciousness all over the world. So sometimes I don't think we should rest on our laurels in India. I think that India should wake up and do exactly what Prabhupada wanted us to do, is to preach in the rest of the world. Yes. When I go outside as an Indian sannyasi, I always feel that I want a chance to preach to the Westerners. Mm. In his purport to Bharat Bhumite Hoila Manishu Janma Jar, Janma Shartak Kuri Kura Paropakar, he gives a very brilliant purport. He said, I am one Indian who came to the West to do this. What will happen if everybody takes this seriously? We can make the whole world, you know, Krishna conscious. Yes, Maharaj. So the larger understanding is that uh, 
uh, every one of us, including everybody in India, the machinery we have and the whole setup and resource we have, should be focused towards giving Krishna consciousness to the rest of the world. And Indians particularly should help that because it's the mandate of Prabhupada. Yes, Master. That's how he started the movement. So in yes, India, Master. it's a sort of uh, less work to awaken the preaching. Yeah. Now, of course, things are changing a bit because of uh, social media and everybody being connected globally uh, instantly and uh, cultures, transcultural imports mm -hmm. and all these things happening within the flick of a you know, finger. Uh, maybe things are slowly changing in a different way. But then India has got this great wealth which Prabhupada has triggered off and I think there's a huge amount of opportunities waiting for people yes. and the situation in the world outside is also like that. They are hungry for getting this information. Yes, Maharaj. Right? Actually, yes. This is this was one thing I think which uh, which connected us quite well because both of us have that concern and even we could say passion for reaching out to Westerners when we met in Perth. Yes. And uh, that's true. So uh, maybe we could today complete our discussion on just analyzing the Indian scenario and maybe we could have a separate discussion on what we okay. as Indians could do to contribute to the West. Okay. So that's a very important subject and it, I think it will require some time. Yeah. So just a couple of points to reflect on what you said. The difference between say outreach in India and in the West. I sometimes put it that in the West, we have to create faith. Whereas yeah. in India, we simply have to remove intellectual obstacles to the natural faith that is there. Yes. There is a piety, there is already a faith, but people, because of education, because of the mainstream media and culture, they have some misconceptions. Why do you worship stones or this or stone images or whatever? So if you just remove those misconceptions, it's, it just grows naturally. In the West also, people have natural, there are people who have natural piety and natural faith, but those people will go to the native religion of that place. Those people go probably to Christianity or whatever. Those who come to us are usually people who are serious explorers. And uh, so re reaching them requires a, a slowly creating faith in them, even in the very basics. So it's much more, it requires a lot more effort. And the second point you mentioned about this, in India also, we are going towards the low hanging fruit. That is very striking and so true. I feel that and I am one of the editors for Back to Godhead, both international and India, Indian. And um, you know, we are desperately short of good quality articles. See? Now, at one time I used to think that, see, I joined in, I was in 96, I joined in 98. And for the first 10, 10 years of my life, uh, I was doing active college preaching, but I was almost completely disconnected from the world. I think for the first 10 years, I never even read a newspaper. There's no net access or anything. So then at that time, I used to think that, at that time also I was writing, I used to think that maybe Indians naturally aren't that good at English, they aren't that good at writing. But from maybe 2011, I started, my spiritual master told me to, learn Western outreach. So I started broadening my reading. So I noticed that uh, if I read Indian newspapers, Indian, uh, Indian magazines, there are thoughtful people. They, they are intelligent, they are articulate, although they may not be spiritual, but we are not attracting that kind of people. Exactly. Even in IITs, even now I have, I have done programs in many IITs and I've connected closely with the students. Very talented, very dedicated. But they are not, um, they are not independently thoughtful kind of people. So those, those IIT students say who come to our programs, there's no mistaking, as I said, their talent and their dedication. But they're not really very good at English. If I compare the kind of articles they would write to, I ask some of them to get the IIT magazines. You know, I, every, mag, every university has its own magazines. And I saw the articles were very, very good in a mundane sense, but good. So somehow uh, our presentation is attracting intelligent people, but not intellectual people. Intelligent means 
I could say more like IQ, high IQ. If you get, I track engineering, medical students, they all have high IQ. But by intellectual, I mean those who really analyze, think, present. So well, I I like to I like to add to that here. Sorry for intervening, but yeah. you see, like you mentioned, uh, the your visit to all these premium institutions and how you felt. Uh, intelligent but not intellectual. That's a very interesting statement. But you see the trend in education in India, especially after the, the post-industrial revolution effect, is uh, that most of the people and the education system is trained towards people becoming professionals of the type like engineers, lawyers, mm -hmm. doctors. And that type of education is what was very prevalent most most popular and very few people went for the humanities and philosophy and of the other type and that in the western world you see a lot of people opt for doing the things that they like to do they were a little yeah. philosophical and everything they learn philosophy the arts sciences and this and that they move that way and their profession comes out of what they like that's true largely but in india it looks like uh, from the the influence of the britishers and the type of modernization that they have had done. Uh, prosperity and uh, forward going means becoming an engineer and uh, a doctor or some of these things. And there were a whole lot of intelligent people making a beeline for these type of things mm. without inquiring about the rich heritage they have and the philosophy and the understanding of reality and everything. They abandoned a lot of that and went this way. I think that's partly the reason why you have intelligent people engaging their intelligence in something which is not really very intelligent uh, towards meeting the end of life, but yeah. abandoning their intellectual uh, resource and abandoning their intellectual landscape and the tradition and everything and opting for something very narrow. That's the type of conditioning the Britishers had on the great culture of India, maybe. That's beautifully put, eh? intelligent people using their intelligence for something not very intelligent. In fact, this was my experience. I did my electronics and telecommunications engineering and uh, probably I would have been more suited for a science career than a technology career. But anyway, in my fourth year, I one of my professors told me that in a class, he said that the most extensive use, this is the 1990s, the most extensive use of electronics engineering is in the manufacture of TVs. <laughs> and when I heard that, I was so disillusioned. I thought I'm using my brain just to make idiot boxes, exactly. for, to make people idiots. I don't want to do this. Exactly. So of course, technology is used for many other purposes, but that's your point. I agree with your point entirely. And also that point of uh, the educational impact this was for many years a puzzle for me that uh, you know, our philosophy, which we have got from our previous generations is profound. If I objectively read the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, and if I read the Bible or the Quran, no disrespect intended to those texts, but there is not much philosophy in those texts. Yeah. So in, in our tradition, we have a lot of philosophy, but if I look at the contemporary literature, Say, if I read a letter, read a editorial of Times of India, and if I read an editorial of New York Times, I find there is a huge difference. In the Times of India editorial, both may be mundane, but still the analysis, the depth, the language, they are almost sophomoric, quite, quite simplistic. New York Times has a lot more depth. So I realized, I was puzzled, why is it like that? And even if you take the God debate, you know, India existence of God is not a big issue. In the West, it's a big issue. So many books are written pro and con. And that the level of arguments are also quite much deeper than what we have in India. So then I, I was puzzled why this happened. But after I started going abroad and I was staying with Grihastha devotees, interacting with their kids, learning what they learn. So I found that even in, although we sometimes con condemn Western education, actually they, the children learn a lot of critical thinking. So they have to read a book and then they have to write, even 
in the primary school and secondary school they read books and they have to write a review of the book what was good what was not good in it and that i i was i went to probably among the better universities and schools in india but i had no exposure like that so i think the as you said the education was meant to make people in a sense perform but perform as uh, you could say as order carriers not so much as visionaries and that applies in the intellectual domain also any thoughts on this mahesh yeah yes that's that's exactly that's why i said that the uh, philosophical enquiry and all that stuff that everybody needs to have Hmm. and um, can get catered to especially in india you have this you have all that ready but somehow that was uh, given a thumb down and uh, prosperity going forward and progress was all you know indicated to be something else so hmm. a choice of most of the students was move towards that definition of progress but they had all along a huge ocean lying next to them of uh, the vedic culture and the philosophy not to say that in india philosophical discussions did not happen to the depth that's happening in the west today but it's happening in the west today in contemporary society according to the issues prevailing cumulatively over a period of time Mm. and they dealing with those issues of science uh, you know uh, rationality and uh, issues social issues and all those things with the type of religion that they had which like you rightly said did not have so such deep foundational imports to it so they are not able to answer it from that platform of philosophy that they have for them religion doesn't mean hinduism and vedic religion but the religion means the christianity mostly in the yeah. western world most of so for them to answer the questions and issues that are coming up with the type of philosophy of religion that they have is very difficult but from this point of view from the vedic philosophy point of view there's a good chance that we'll answer those uh, you know questions provided you understand here the vedic premise also yeah. so my point is that earlier in in the vedic philosophy you have all sorts of people out of the six darshanas you have you know kanada kapila all of them a lot of them are atheistic philosophies but they have very strong arguments strong arguments and it was open and all embracing and very broad to you know that's the reason why the vedic philosophy is open for any type of thought any type of construct to find it. a space there so mm-hmm. uh, that type of a platform to give up that type of a platform enquiry into the absolute into reality and all those things and going for you know becoming an engineer or something you really close yourself down so much and turn a blind eye to everything else that you know so that's a lot of foolishness that was perpetrated foolishness oh. perpetrated on a whole wonderful populace that is actually intelligent so prabhupada speaks a lot about the degradation of culture in india brought out by the britishers and the uh, you know, britishers did more damage to it than the moguls the moguls were all mostly sense gratifiers and they had wow. dance and good architecture and drink and they were happy with that but the britishers did come down and really work down towards the culture of india and break it down and introduce a totally new concept and i think the education moved in that direction and still is moving in that direction to a great extent that's why iskon coming in and showing what's the real philosophical basis of hinduism and what's the nuts and bolts of it has had a good impact on many intelligent youngsters it's a discovery for them that's very true right Yes, man. You know, this is a good, good hist- historical angle to it. See, the Islamic invaders, they destroyed temples, uh, but they were never intellectual challengers. 
Yeah. Even whereas when the British came, because they had science and special technology with them, exactly. so they posed an intellectual threat. They didn't destroy temples, but they often destroyed the faith that made Indians <coughs> go to the temples. Very subtle. Yeah. And subtle, deeper and finer aspects. Yeah, far more yeah, wide ranging, in a sense. Yeah. That impact has, you know, taken a deep toll of uh, many of uh, Indians and their understanding of religion and philosophy. Uh, so I think that's why the education system is also like that. Mm-hmm. And that's where Iskand's teachings and Prabhupada's teachings come in as a breath of fresh air and throwing light on uh, real issues of life and reorienting everybody towards the great wealth of uh, Krishna consciousness. Mm. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, earlier you mentioned this point that you know, the big temples came up like the Bangalore temple and before. So Prabhupada also, if we consider in India, his primary emphasis seems to have been on building big temples. So uh, in, the obs- in your historical observation over the last say four decades, how much do you think the big temples have say, say played a substantial role in, in expanding our outreach? Because in one sense, my understanding is, you know, Giriraj Maharaj has just recently completed almost a 800 page book on the Juhu temple. Prabhupada told him to write it. So he had asked me to review it. I went through it. It's a beautiful book. We described Prabhupada's dedication. And it seems that Prabhupada had a great vision of how that temple would become like a base from which our outreach would go far and wide. Now, but to put it on the other side, there's one devotee, one Prabhupada disciple who's based in Juhu. He told me that at one time, we were so understaffed that we, we would go to the railway stations and tell people who were sleeping on the stations you know, why are you sleeping here? You come and stay in the temple. We will provide you food and you do some service. So we were getting, we were had that kind of people. So he was appreciating the kind of the caliber of people we are coming, coming now. So, so just how do you see the role of big temples in, in the expansion of our outreach? Well, definitely a temple plays a powerful role and attracting people. And ISKCON temples have got a very unique place in the the hearts of many people. They like it, they like to visit. Temples are very well kept. The deity worship is very good compared to many other temples. It's clean and the atmosphere is nice and you can learn something. You can take home something important. Mm. Prabhupada's temples are educational institutions. Wherever the temples are really giving out Krishna consciousness, knowledge, and training people and doing the job properly, then their temple is very useful and uh, can produce a lot of good results. But wherever the temples are not able to perform, according to what Prabhupada designed and crafted the temples for, that is in terms of bringing Krishna consciousness to people and affecting a change in their life permanently and them becoming devotees of Krishna and having a better understanding of reality and life and the goal of life and everything. If it is not able to do that, then you know, it becomes a burden mm. to the few people who are managing it. So we need people who have the proper vision to use these tools to achieve what is the final product. If you look at us, ourselves as a corporation or as like an enterprise that's working, what is our final product? We should work towards that. And sometimes in certain places, temples are not required to produce that final product. And sometimes it is required uh, to do that. So we have to you know, gauge these things accordingly. And if you look at it now in this digital world, temples are not so much required because all our temples under lockdown are shut off 
but every one of us is very active online and maybe contacting and reaching far greater number of people than we were to having a brick and mortar temple or whatever right so these are when you define a temple <clears throat> in our mind immediately it crops up that we have to have a structure physically and everything but that's also changing a little bit now because people are congregating online and uh, we may not be able to do everything that we do in a temple but things are changing so similarly if we can utilize the temple for what we really want to gain as a goal then it's perfectly all right but the problem is sometimes we don't because of shortage of manpower or people unwilling to do that type of a service committed having less number of people who do it, that type of a committed service and many such associated uh, difficulties yeah. funding and everything everything together you know, but yeah. still temples have played a great role in india especially iskon temples great uh, load great what load great role in role. Okay, role yeah bringing good uh, amount of spiritual sucker american uh, calendar ashriya means uh, you know uh, people who are <coughs> interested and who are coming to the temple for something so if a temple has got that type of uh, that type of uh, ambience then it attracts those people more and more <clears throat> and it may build around that so temples are very important in india and in india people go to temples and it is a place where you can meet people and uh, it provides you a place where you can show your wares uh, or rather exhibit what you are your books your philosophy your practice your congregation and the lifestyles and uh, convince people to uh, take up krishna consciousness or convince people to accept this type of a lifestyle and the benefits accruing from it so yes, that's sir. important place you know after observing several temples say in india as well as abroad i thought of two terms i would like your feedback on this like there is a inside out approach to temple building and a outside in approach so outside in approach means that uh, first of all i appreciate your point that temples are vital and uh, in fact from my understanding prabhupad made big temples as the distinctive feature of our movement in the broad religious uh, you could say panoply that is there in india it's a, so as you said not only magnificent temples but extraordinary cleanliness beautiful deity worship so these are all distinctive i remember gopal krishna maharaj once told me that he he went to jaipur somewhere and the jaipur is the place where they make deities so he said that there they had a one of the jaipur deity makers he had a notice written over there iskon deities made here so he was promoting himself that way the deities are so beautiful you can get that kind of product here so yeah. our temples are distinctive but this inside out and outside in what i meant by that is that if we build a community and then build a temple then we have the human resources available for say doing for doing outreach to the temple but if we first focus on building the temple so inside out means we have a community inside and then the temple comes up the outside in is where we build a temple and then we seek to get devotees then the challenge so my question to you is my <clears throat> question is if you can already build a community why do you need a temple because the community is big and we want to make it bigger like i can say from the, my experience in napune because because the community can be utilized again the community can use the temple for outreach or the community needs the temple and my question is a counter question to you if you are able to build a community without a temple then why do you actually opt to have a temple because the end product is that we want people to take up krishna consciousness we want to build a community of devotees okay so let my question is yeah, at the end why did you have yeah i understand your question 
say that uh, okay let me give two ex examples say i spent most of my early brahmachari life in nasik sorry in pune then i was in mumbai belgaum for some time now of course i travel most of the most of the time so in pune what i saw was there was a very small temple but the because they were educated devotees and there were lots of programs happening so the outreach expanded and now there is a wonderful big temple so we already had a community and then there is a big temple uh, in contrast i was in a temple in america now of course there is a lot of history about what happened in america and that could be a separate subject but i was talking and they have many deities elaborate deity worship and one of the devotees over there uh, he is from india and he went there and then he had a great desire for outreach but he told me that he did a calculation of how much time or they have a limited number of devotees how is their time spent so he said that in my observation we are almost like spending the proportion of time on deity worship versus the proportion of time on outreach it's 25 to 1 so we are spending about 25 hours on deity worship and 1 hour on outreach so i thought that prabhupad would never want something like this prabhupad exactly. wanted a temple temple not for the temple itself temple for outreach so exactly. sometimes when we have so when we have big temples without a sufficiently big enough community then we become very we could say internally consumed in just trying to maintain the temple and then we also seem to come off as very utilitarian when people come to temple first thing that happens is somebody asks solicits donations from them instead of actually offering them something spiritual so i remember when i first went to vrindavan i was i was in white dhoti gurb and as soon as i entered the temple i had gone at the part of the vrindavan parikrama with radhanath maharaj but i had come a little later than everyone else so as soon as i came in the first thing is somebody called me and said can you give some donation and i was quite disillusioned by that then i told him that okay i'm a brahmachari i i am brahmachari i said i had just joined that is oh okay then he just you know he just lost interest in me and just went and uh, i just turned to someone else so that what i meant is that if we have a big temple and we don't have devotees then we tend to become either too self we become too self self consumed so that's my experience now regarding your question about if you already have a community then why do we need a temple that's a very good question uh, so maybe as i said that because the community is so big so we need a bigger temple but uh, so you are saying if i understand right is that only when we have a big temple we have people coming in and then through those people coming in we can build a big community we can build a community no i'm not i'm not exactly saying that that's the only way it should happen but i'm just throwing in this question for a little more dialogue and deeper understanding okay because i think that we distribute books hmm we build temples then we have devotees as an outcome yeah our outcome we are like i mentioned to you any cooperation in enterprise our, our final outcome is that we want people of faith in krishna yes in keeping with the definition of faith based organizations that we are sometimes uh, called i yeah. would say a derogatory expression to say that you guys are faith based organizations uh, in the uh, setup that we have Uh, especially in the dialogues that the word devotion faith has a little christian connotation maybe you yes. you want people to have devotion for krishna yeah or so love for krishna that's the final that's the final product yeah building up the faith of people towards krishna i mean god the absolute truth and everything to put it in more secular terms uh, so that's the reason and whatever tools that we use our tool is mainly harinam sankirtan and the books of prabhupad to bring people's faith up and everything but in a place like india where where temple is temple culture is very common and very prevalent if you also have that temple within the other temples that people have in various different organizations then your marketing is very good and people will also come to you 
and you can show them what you have. So in that sense, temples are very important in India, no doubt. But coming back to a point of, we are doing all these things, our final end product is people of faith, which means devotees. So sometimes like each of these tools, which Prabhupada has given us, how do we use them? Temples, how we use them? Books and book distribution, how do we use them? Do we distribute books? I'm asking a very bold question. Okay. okay. Do we distribute books for the sake of distributing books only, period? Hmm. And having numbers? Or do we distribute books for the sake of affecting people, changing their heart, and actually having them come to become uh, Krishna conscious people, and then carry your book further to others? to distribute them. There is a very subtle thing I'm saying, book distribution should not be stopped. It's our main way of, uh, you know, communicating to people this great philosophy, especially among the literate class of people. Mm. It should not be stopped, but we should not do ritualistic book distribution. We should simply not distribute books for the sake of distribution of books. I, I, I know people are going to say, no, 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 Prabhupada wanted books to be distributed anyway. But Prabhupada wanted books to be distributed anyway because he knew each one of these books are going to affect people. But what's happening with, if I ask you, if you have distributed 500 million pieces of literature, what percentage of the books were actually read? Hmm. It's a very interesting thing to note because we're talking about, uh, you know, bringing in people uh, and increasing their faith. What percentage of the books actually get read? Because I'm selling a product, I want it to be used, and I want you to tell others that I've used this, it's wonderful, you should get it. But we are distributing books, but I don't think a great percentage of the books that we distribute are read. It's up to us to actually look into this. So, and quite often I get the answer that, no, the books Prabhupada said are bombs, they will actually you know, explode, and over a period of time, they'll... So I said, what stops you from detonating the bomb right now as you distribute the books? Let the explosion happen right away. And then it will you know, spread like nothing. We don't have to wait. It's not a time bomb uh, by default that it is you know, uh, made to have to go off at some particular time in the future. So value-aided book distribution to achieve our end. If we do, uh, times have changed a lot. So, and people have changed also. So what you need to do to give this information in terms of book distribution, you need to do. So in the same way, temples also, what is the temple there for? Use that for that end. And if you need to change things in the temple, you need to change. Just like I'm saying, change the book distribution methodologies or uh, you know, how you would actually look at it so that you get the desired result. Yeah. If I say, if I distribute a Bhagavad Gita, because I started doing that in my area, I thought about this a lot. I was also incidentally chairing the outreach strategic planning team of the GBC. I was a chair of the outreach committee for a long time. In oh. fact, even now, over a period of time, it's become a little inactive and maybe almost inactive nowadays. But at that time, we had a lot of these exercises and discussions. So value-aided book distribution would mean that I make the man, help the man to read the book and get a, take a peek into it and taste it a little bit and aid his reading. Then he would become a person who would read, understand, practice and start distributing this knowledge more. So we start creating people who are book distributors rather than taking the whole burden on myself only to distribute books day in and day out. That's true. And I don't, I'm making a very subtle point. I just yes, uh, creating book distributors yes, by giving them value-added uh, you know, uh, facility through the books, introducing the content of the books, yeah. and then increasing the book distribution exponentially because each one of them will love this book and the content and want to give it to others. Yes. You know, you're, you're igniting a different type of book distribution. Uh, not that only you have to go day by day and approach people on the streets every day and keep doing it, 
But if you do it in such a way that each one of them who took a book is introduced to the content of the book and becomes a distributor of the content of the book and the book, it's great for you. So that's the way we look at book distribution. And like you're talking about temples, temples also, we should utilize them and nicely fabricate the outreach strategy in that to attract people to Krishna consciousness dynamically. Then temples are always good. I think it is in the way we use these tools or the way we have gravitated to usage of these tools that we need to look into. The tools in themselves are, you know, very potent. This is a beautiful understanding that, that there are tools and in some ways it is quite radical because you are, you are maybe questioning some of what is like received wisdom. But to put it in a scriptural context also, two, three thoughts I had that one is, one of the things that can actually disrupt bhakti is Niyamagraha. And Niyamagraha is following the letter, one meaning of Niyamagraha is following the letter of the law while forgetting the purpose. So in some ways, both in book distribution and in temple construction, sometimes we may get so caught in doing it that we forget the purpose. And the essential purpose, in my understanding, yes, of course, what you said is Shraddha. People are giving, giving them faith so that they move toward Krishna. Uh, what our movement can offer distinctively is satsang. Is actually association of people, either they may not be pure devotees, but at least they are serious, seriously devoted. And sometimes we get so caught in building a temple and maintaining a temple that we are not able to give association to people. Sometimes we are so caught in distributing books that our focus is more on making the person buy the book than giving them a positive perception of devotees so that they will want to come to a temple. Or even if they come to a temple, there is no one to talk with them. So I think that is, uh, it's actually vital that we able to, all these are ways in which people can get the association of devotees and through that, that from there, they will, another scriptural context I thought of putting is, Kanishta to Madhyama. What takes the Kanishta to the Madhyama is the association of devotees. And now whether we build temples where people come and in, in some ways it's a matter of uh, pride for our movement that many of our temples are on India's tourism map. It, not just uh, culture, spiritual tourism but even generic tourism map that magnificent our temples are. But at the same time, we don't want just people to come as tourists. We want them to move forward. And what will take them forward is not just the architecture or the beauty. It is what it's primarily only the association of devotees. And that, that's what I meant earlier with the inside out approach that we need to have devotees who can use these resources properly. And those devotees, and somehow we, this is also another point which uh, related. I was talking with one senior Shila Prabhupada disciple and he said that you know, Prabhupada was very much into numbers. You know, how many books who distributed, how many books were distributed. So he said that this was Prabhupada's way of channeling our passion. We were all very young at that time and we had passion and Prabhupada channeled it by urging us to have constructive competition of how many books were distributed. But somehow we may have got too caught in those numbers itself. And then we forget the purpose. The purpose is not just to distribute books. The purpose is actually to develop relationships uh, and thereby get people to come closer to Krishna. So one problem in Niyamagraha is that we get caught in, so we had this definition of success how many temples we built, how many books we distributed, and how many devotees we made. So somehow how many devotees we made, that had been a little overlooked. And sometimes even devotees making, it is also sometimes, it could be sometimes a little external. Okay, this person has become, taken initiation, now just forget that person and move on to somebody else. So the ongoing transformation of heart and the elevation of consciousness toward Krishna, that we might overlook. Oh. That's the point. That's the point. The point is that, you see, Prabhupada, when he started the movement, he had the daunting task of introducing 
Krishna consciousness in a total foreign place. And uh, he did it. He had a strategy. He said, I have hatched a transcendental plot. Mm. And he had a strategy. He had a very, uh, you know, clean idea of how to get what he wanted. He's a genius. So he did that. And he did, he did it without any resources. He didn't even have money to pay the rent of the place that he took first. But uh, he had a very great dynamism uh, and uh, his outreach effectually, uh, all that we put together is very good. And he didn't have a temple and everything. Over a period of time, even in the West for a long time, they didn't have some great temples or anything. But uh, Krishna consciousness has got its own value. In a place like India, of course, there is value and there is facility for building a big temple and there are donors and everything together. We can utilize all these things and, you know, really do something amazing. All these mm. uh, resources, provided we utilize them to the best extent. Sometimes I feel that we're not utilizing our great looking temples to the fullest extent to yield the type of results that they can yield huge structures and huge things. Like you said that it's like a tourist place, lots of people coming and just go like a mall. Uh, but I don't know how much you are affecting the people because that is the purpose. So although you may have big temples and lots of people visit them and you get lots of donations and they become famous, they are tourist spots, everything. But what we need to really measure, and I'm not against measuring against numbers, in terms of number of books and of what we really, really measure, how many people's faith have we affected? How many hearts we have changed? That will be the real measure. That will be the most important number. Uh, not only number of books and number of people who visited, but also how many people's hearts were changed? How many started chanting the Hare Krishna Mahamantra or seriously read Bhagavad Gita or seriously took up Krishna consciousness? That's the number I think is most important to measure. Not that we shouldn't measure the other numbers. Yes, that's also an indication, a very good indication mm. of the type of people who are coming to you and the market you have and everything. But I call it the conversion ratio. Whatever outreach you do, whatever impact you create, you may create a great impact, but what's your conversion? How many of those people whom you impacted are you able to convert to people of faith? in Krishna consciousness. Yeah. I would measure every, every outreach activity in terms of that, whether it's book distribution or it is opening a big temple and anything. Uh, that's some number that we should keep in our mind uh, to exactly measure our effectiveness. Yes, Maharaj. I think I'm making a point uh, that most uh, marketing people would speak about. Yeah. Actually, you know, where they coming down to brass tacks, what did I really get? What's my profit? In Krishna consciousness, we are not measuring profit in terms of the monies we have, the properties we have. Sometimes we tend to think that way. But our real property is devotees. And I'll go a little further and say, devotees with faith in the words of Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita in the words of Prabhupada, in the Bhagavatam, and progressing, honing it down further and further. What is outreach? It's devotees with deep commitment and faith in Krishna consciousness. That's our final product. Isn't it? Yes, beautifully good, Maharaj. This, the word conversion ratio is a little provocative. Because in the words, I, I, I should the word use the word conversion, but for want of a better word at this moment, yeah, I understand. I'm I, just saying. I was how much have you converted your impact into fruit? Yeah, there's but, a nice saying, Bhakti Siddhanta Sasri Tagal, Shoshyatam Griham Agatam, something like that. It's a bring the grains home, bring the harvest home. That is, you have planted seeds. Okay. You have plowed the land, you have prepared the place, you've planted, you've grown, you've watered, you've, you know, done a lot of things. And finally, please bring the harvest home. Get the product home. Hmm. So somehow in our whole, uh, Prabhupada did that in his, you can see in his very effective preaching, he would get the pr produce home. 
and he would say this for my enjoyment i cultivated it, it belongs to me <laughs> uh, to put it in a very very uh, you know uh, blunt way but sometimes we have all these grand temples and everything and we think we've done a great ratyatra festival we've done a great program but i like to measure at the end of it how many people have been affected they have broadcast preaching ratyatra is like broadcast preaching you know they come out and we say similarly our temples are also broadcast preaching but our focus should actually be towards like you said developing relationships with people and actually gradually uh influencing them with krishna consciousness and the practice of it and making their faith grow that's yeah. the end product it's so true i think prabhupad also said that in his bhagavad gita introduction that if one person becomes a pure devotee i'll consider my endeavor successful so even if pure devotee is a long way away but at least some some direction that dire- some progress in that direction that is what is vital so maharaj i it's like a big, it's like a big pyramid i would say that the pyramid the base of the pyramid uh you know is all the people whom we contact and all the people who come to our places of worship then uh, many of them appreciate and then we go to the next level of people who actually uh s- s- you know start liking us and come regularly then after some time there are those who actually start following some of the principles we tell them worship tulasi offer your food at home and take prasadam chant a round of krishna uh, you know maha mantra and then bring on sundays or something then you reach a higher portion of the whole pyramid and then gradually their commitment increases at the apex of the pyramid you have people who are committed to krishna consciousness thinking that this is my life i want to achieve this i want love of krishna i want bhakti i am becoming a bhakti yogi they have confirmed it and the rest is like details to work out uh, you know whether you are a grahastha or a brahmachari or this or that and how you will achieve it in that particular ambience and circumstances so the whole lot of this thing is called outreach even people not only at the apex should be focused on we should focus on everybody who comes there and have them up a notch have them go up and facilitating the entire travel up the pyramid to the apex is what the temple should do yeah so you have people in our congregations who are very simple and they practice krishna consciousness in their house and that's like a very good uh, way of telling them to do it but there may be some others who are single men who think that i would rather be full time doing this because it's so attractive to me there are very few between this and that you have a whole lot of others also so catering to all of them at various levels is what a temple can do and uh, you have a big uh, community around it and people are at various levels of the pyramid and they appreciate that they are traveling up the pyramid and they are facilitated to travel up and they like to do it so in this way you have effective uh, outreach using the temple yes this pyramid metaphor is beautiful i feel that in the early days a metaphor might have been more like a it's like a enclave surrounded by a moat where we have insiders and outsiders and yes. there was a very strong we they mentality you know we are devotees and they are non devotees and and we have various words which you often use with a derogatory sense to refer to them also so to yeah. some extent a more mature uh, vision of outreach which is also reflective of uh, the broader way in which it was in the vedic tradition Now, even if people were not devoted to the lord they were at least worshiping some devotees and that is also appreciated so in that similar sense and so if we have that pyramid kind of approach then it means the two things one is that if somebody wants to go all the way up we provide them that facility but somebody just wants to take a few steps up we provide them that facility and give them acceptance also so uh, that would be very 
we could say very multi faceted outreach or multi level outreach and we can actually have a huge impact in india by that approach rather than the we they kind of approach yes maharaj see that so the hindus hindus will fit in in the all their you know that big uh, variety of things that they do right from demigod worship to you know some other type of worship and also hinduism is like a whole lot of potpourri of so many things together now yeah but uh, if you throw a net like this we accommodate all of them somewhere or the other because of the hinduism fervor in them and we like to embrace that and uh, take that momentum in india preaching should be we take that momentum we relate with all sorts of hindus all sorts of people and uh, it's our duty to lead them towards the crux uh the philosophy of krishna consciousness which is the conclusion of the shastras which is conclusion of the bhagavad gita the bhagavat and everything which means that like you rightly said we all embracing hmm. seeing this all embracing effort even the christians and the muslims all get very interested in community and uh, all embracing approach that we have a place for everybody somewhere so that they can render some service to krishna directly indirectly and are somehow in the net of krishna consciousness and they can move up i think that's the type of thing prabhupad wanted to do mm-hmm. he had uh, time for all sorts of people and he always thought of something to engage this person in krishna consciousness so very very uh, dynamic and uh, very resourceful way of yes. giving people krishna consciousness now devamrut sorry just to continue devamrut maharaj told me something very striking he said that uh, he had his brother he is very well educated he is from yale his brother was also a prominent lawyer and he gave his brother some books and he invited him to go to the temple and his brother went to the temple and he said you know i am a lawyer and i can i i, I can help you in some ways uh, and whoever was there in the temple uh generally in the west we are not able to get people who are well established in society to even come to our temple it's more people on the fringes who come so who are in the temple they said actually we already have our lawyer we don't need anyone and then he just went away and he, was, he never came back to a temple after that <laughs> so maharaj was telling that you know that even if you have no no need for him create some service and give him some service connect him if he's already come so connect them in some way so somehow i think the op- uh, the approach of one zero either you are a devotee or you are non devotee we need to go beyond that like one zero paradigm and accept that people will be at different levels and we appreciate them and we engage them that's a binary it's not only binary thinking yeah devotee non devotee exactly black white i think i i call that dwandva moha <laughs> Oh, that's really <laughs> <laughs> that is brilliant and think like that you have to be thinking i do not know use the right word but it has to be completely integrated thinking yeah everybody has a place in krishna consciousness and you have to proper said you know rack your brains where i can fit in this person how i will engage this person and have him move up the ladder move up the pyramid yeah. that is the real thing that people should be trained in it's not that you know i don't know how to engage you i mean sorry uh, then it's a failure yeah so i think prabhupad once said that you know this krishna consciousness movement has been practically invented by me so he said that the responsibility of the spiritual master is to find ways and means to help the disciple fix the mind on krishna so similarly we also have to somehow come up with creative ways to engage people and i think that would be the basic purpose of our movement you know, to engage people and to encourage them to rise now how far they rise up that is up to their free will but at least we provide them that facility yes maharaj maharaj i think we yes. have planned for one and a half hours i don't want to extend your time too much are you okay continue for some time more or should we summarize and wind up how are you placed i am okay you can okay 
then maybe just some two three questions i'll ask related with what we have discussed till now and at least yeah. to some extent the indian outreach will be able to conclude okay. yeah so <clears throat> now with respect to temples and uh, book distribution we talked about this i mentioned earlier also the confrontational and non confrontational approaches that uh, so you also brought that up in the actual outreach say uh, how much do you find a confrontational approach either essential or beneficial you know for example i grew up um, i was attracted by the scientific presentation of krishna consciousness and then i also read about say for example evolution and uh, i read about the problems with it and i found it quite impressive that we have issues like this but over a period of time as i have read more more of science i find that evolution is a very complex issue and sometimes our our refutation what we call as refutations are quite simplistic and when i have talked with western devotees in the west especially evolution is not a big issue in the west but i am giving that as an example that uh, i have found that evolution itself doesn't stop anyone from coming to bhakti but our criticizing evolution stops them from coming to bhakti so now how they in their mind reconcile evolution and and our philosophy that is something which each devotee finds their own way i know devotees who are who are doctorates in evolution and that's their daily profession and still they are initiated devotees and they are practicing so they have their ways of reconciling but so what i found is that sometimes something which is not an obstacle we perceive it as an obstacle and then we criticize it and that criticism makes us seem sectarian and that sect that perception of sectarianism becomes a obstacle so in the west especially if you if we criticize evolution then we are associated with uh, right right wing science rejecting kind of religious religious fanatic extremists so by the same token in india uh, india already is a very religious country and we usually have say two targets for criticism one is uh, advaitavad and the other is uh, the worship of the devtas so even for these two i i have i try to use non judgmental words i don't like to use the word mayavad because somehow we do use it with a very judgmental tone and i also am not very comfortable with the word demigods because it seems to come off as pejorative so i use with indian audiences i simply use the word devtas so but these two we do often criticize them but have you seen these two actually being a major obstacles for people to come to krishna or is it that our criticism does more harm than good so is it something similar to what evolution is in the west well that's a very good uh, question what i would like to <coughs> say <coughs> a little comment on uh, evolution and the topic of evolution maybe is very relevant in the western world yeah again because of the religious background there with christianity and everything together yes science religion that's has been a big something thing. that needs to be contested in the western world and for western minded thinking etc yeah. but like you rightly said we let sleeping dogs lie it is an issue maybe but in india i wouldn't want to discuss evolution it need not be yeah need not be discussed uh, but sometimes we land up discussing this within you know in a presentation and we uh, you know wake up a sleeping dog unnecessarily especially with an indian audience you could very well like you said be talking something about impersonalistic idea of the absolute truth or a personal idea of the truth and things like that Mm. if at all somebody had a little inclination towards western thinking uh it's the way you present many of the things that prabhupad said he spoke about in terms of western preaching mm. he attacked darwinism materialism he 
spoke about scientists very strongly in some places, yeah. but at the same time, highly in other places about scientists. So all these things are to do with the, I told you his mandate was to preach in the Western world. That's and the predominant issues always have been Darwinism because Darwinism is definitely deeply atheistic and all that we can say. If you examine it very deeply, it's hitting at the base, at the foundation of belief and faith in God. Uh, if you I will just it. qualify this a little bit. I think this will be a big subject in itself. Um, so there are a number of influential Christian thinkers who have also propagated theistic evolution. And uh, instead of, this is a big discussion and I won't go into it, but I just make this point that what I put it is that instead of saying that Darwinism is atheistic, what I say is that Darwinism is a very powerful tool in the hands of atheists. So Darwin himself was not an atheist, uh, but it has been used extensively by atheists to propagate atheism. So Darwinism is a scientific theory. So, so in other words, in other words, the way the most of the world understands Darwin's proposal yes. is only heard from the mouth of atheists. Yes, that's true. Okay, what we have popularly or mostly learned about Darwinism is that which came out of the mouth of atheistic yes. people. That's what I think you're trying to say. Yes, Maharaj. I talk about evolution. What are you trying to say? That evolution as, say, observed phenomena. Like say, you have a small apple becoming big or you have a, a small dog and a big dog. That's observed evidence. Then there is inferred mechanism. That evolution of the inferred mechanism refers to one species changing into another. So with the first, there is no need to doubt it. It's, it's observed. Second, it's an inference and the mainstream scientific community accepts it. There are some scientists who oppose it. But the third is Darwinism as an all explaining ideology. That which explains the origin of consciousness. See, Prabhupada's main argument is life comes from life. Life doesn't come from matter. And that life comes from matter is not a Darwinian proposal. Darwin himself said that the creator breathed the first life. And then afterwards other things came. So I think my, our problem is primarily with the third, that all explaining ideology. And this is how it is portrayed in the mainstream culture. Although that's not how it is. If you go into the serious study of Darwinism, all that the science can tell us is evolution as an observed phenomena and evolution as an inferred mechanism. Science doesn't talk about evolution as an ideology. That is what atheists talk about. And Prabhupada's critique was also, you know, there is an elaborate conversation of Prabhupada with uh, Shamsundar Prabhu in the Veda base. And an abridged version of that comes in the Dialectic Spiritualism book. And even more abridged is what we have in Life Comes From Life book. So in the elaborate conversation, when Shamsundar Prabhu gives the evidence, you know, we they found this kind of fossil. So Prabhupada doesn't dismiss that. Prabhupada explains it. Okay, it could have happened like this. It could have happened like this. So I don't think we have any quarrel with the first. The second, the jury is open. But our Prabhupada's main issue was, there's a quote of Prabhupada where he says that, we are not against the science scientists' spirit of knowing. We are against their atheism. So, mm -hmm. so that, that's what I was that's saying about evolution. Yeah. Okay. That's so, interesting. Yeah, when evolution is used to propagate atheism, then it is a problem. But evolution itself is non-theistic. Is it neither talks about God, for or against. But mainstream mainstream perception through the media is that evolution is atheistic. But intrinsically it is not. Yeah. Anyway, that's a my, my my reading of my reading of evolution may not be so deep. Yes, but I'm just speaking about the popular understanding. Yes, of course. Generally, the way they look at it. But you have made a very good analysis of it uh, deeply. That's interesting. But what I'm trying to say is that in the context of the Western world, that is very important. Hmm. But in India, you don't have to really speak about Darwin's theory so much because it's not the uppermost thing in their mind. Uh, uh, in terms of, like you rightly said, the uppermost thing in their mind may be demigod worship and an impersonalistic idea of, uh, you know, something, Advaitavada, whatever, 
and uh, that is coming in uh, tradition, in their own tradition, in their minds. So maybe we could very subtly bring in the personal aspect, even without talking about, I don't like I preach in Kerala, I don't really confront the, uh, you know, other Advaitavad people so much because they can really bring out arguments and they can quote from the scripture uh, from here and there. And maybe we won't be so good at it. Uh, in, in, unless you're a real scholar and very well read and you can sit and talk these things to such a great extent. But we are interested in bulk of the people are actually simple. They are not like very much interested in arguing out many of these things to the hilt. But they have a basic understanding and they would like to up their understanding. And I think a positive presentation of Krishna consciousness without being too confrontational will do a lot of preaching. This section which you're calling, uh, talking about the intellectual people in India especially, they are not like the whole range gamu of people. They are a thin section, I think, uh, especially to do with Advaitavad and uh, you know other type of demigod worship, maybe a little more, you know, broader. But Advaitavad and all that, you don't need to really confront confront them too much. Most people are happy with the simple philosophical presentation and the basics of Bhagavad Gita and introducing them to Harinam and the practice in Sadhana. So I think we should sidestep sometimes. What Prabhupada did in confronting scientists and confronting Mayavadis and confronting that, this very boldly, is for us to understand what things are as they are. But we have to use these things according to time, place, and circumstance, uh, strategically. And like I said, don't have to say certain things which are not required in certain places. People directly quote Prabhupada and his strong statements and get into the mood. And uh, with learned people, educated people, scientifically oriented people and all of them who are actually very sensitive and they have their opinions and they're intelligent people. We don't need to, you know, push this on them right in the beginning. That's what I mean. I mean to say that they have to be very sensitively handled. And uh, if you did not know the topic very much, it's better to refer to somebody else. And if you need to know it, and if you have the capacity to know it, to study it up and speak about it in a manner that is encouraging to the other person, uh, that he has his point of view. And uh, I know this much about it, and I have this angle and this angle. And uh, having a healthy discussion, that sometimes is lacking. You know, Having giving people their uh, you know freedom to think the way they have been thinking and they have acclimatized themselves, and then expressing your point of view that's what's the meaning of a dialogue. Mm. We should not be confrontational. Chan Kazi and Lord Chaitanya had a dialogue. Dialogue Beautiful. in most of the places, Lord Chaitanya had a dialogue with Sarva Bhattacharya, he had a dialogue. He was so patient that for seven days he sat down and heard Sarva Bhattacharya's interpretation of the whole Vedas. And then he very mildly proposed, when was, he was asked, what's your opinion? He very mildly proposed and started a dialogue. He crept into him. So I think dialogues are very important. People like to have a dialogue wherein their position is not threatened. And uh, we are able to present our whole, you know, proposal in a nice way with yeah. due respect to you also and your point of view but to go around saying i'm holier than thou and you know to go around saying that my point of views you know supersedes yours and we can, and that too without being properly prepared with the subject matter of the person who's sitting in front of you and what he knows etc will put us in a very bad uh, and quite often i've seen sometimes these things happening and uh, I think, uh, you know, it was not at all handled properly. Educated, learned uh, people, scientists and all of them, they definitely proper treated them in a very different way. They encouraged them to 
bring out their point of view and he gave his point of view and they always left feeling good uh, that they were heard and they were considered and I don't have to accept your point of view but I came to learn something about your point of view which is a good uh, step that you had them listen to you and you heard them. I think this is how Lord Chaitanya would discuss with the Chan Kazi. Chan Kazi will give his idea of kaukiling as mentioned in the scriptures. And Lord Chaitanya will say, no, this is the real import and this is real purport to that. This is how you should understand that. This is a dialogue. Yeah. Our devotees should learn to dialogue because that is the method that Lord Chaitanya adopted. I don't see Lord Chaitanya in any way confronting any Mayavadi or very <clears throat> boldly sitting and uh, arguing with him out or something. Most of the situations were the dialogues. It's beautiful, Mara, this dialogue part. Now, I, there is a difference between talking with people and talking to people, or worse still, talking mm. down to yeah. people. Exactly. So for most, most of us, most devotees, the idea is the only reason I am talking with non-devotees in double quotes is to talk to them or talk down to them. And yes. It would be interesting to see if we had, if we put together all of Prabhupada's conversations with intellectuals, whatever we had, I don't remember anywhere Prabhupada using uh, judgmental words like fools or rascals in those conversations at all. Like I could do a search no, to find out, yeah. but I don't think Prabhupada, Prabhupada did that very much in his private conversations. So. Yes. But these private conversations are being made public now. That is a and they, they, they go out of context and they have a you know, detrimental effect on the outreach. Much. You see, we should, that's why I'm saying how to use Prabhupada's words and private conversations. And you see, Prabhupada wrote a lot of things in his books also that were very heavy statements. But in his behavior with people, he was very smooth and very cultured and very accommodative. Uh, you know, he would write these things in the night, in the morning, he would be very good to the same people whom he is writing about. <laughs> he would talk, come take prashadam, you are so nice, you are that, you are this and everything. And then he will have them read his books over a period of time. And they will come to know this man is a man who has written these things. But he has already entered my heart. And uh, he is, his, the way he has presented it, makes it very convincing to him and the way he has conducted himself, you know, I'm willing to accept that. You know, there are ways of convincing people. So Prabhupada was uh, very good. He could do all these things and still come away uh, with a good, victorious, uh, you know, uh, what do you call result by, you know, affecting that person. So that's, uh, that's an interesting thing about Paying, paying proper respect to people. After all, all these scientists and thinkers, they're all gyanis of one type. And uh, they are important because they have got intelligence and they think they have intellectual capacity. And uh, they are very important because it's class preaching that we can do to them. And wow. if you can somehow have them, have them intellectually chew these uh, you know, proposals, uh, something wonderful may come out of them. You know, that's the best we can expect. That's the best we can expect. Yes, in this also, I think there are two kinds of people, those who are, say, committed to some other path. If somebody is a committed Advaita Vadi or is like a completely committed worshipper of the Devtas, then it's very unlikely that they are going to come to us. But our confrontational words is only going to make them reject us as biased and it's going to really make very strong hard feelings. On the other hand, most people even if they may be born in a particular family which was worshipping a particular Devata or was, was Advaita Vadi, most people in my understanding are maybe an under Advaitic influence. They are not Advaita Vadis. And quite often because of whatever was there in their, whatever they learned from their priests or their guru or their family, that's what actually opens them to explore spirituality and then they come to us because of that. So, and then, because in a sense, they're open to spirituality wherever they get it. This is what I have experienced. This is what I knew, but this I'm open to it. 
and you are right and what has brought them to us if we criticize that itself then it completely shuts them down exactly so it's a, exactly and it's not that just because they have some advaitic influence it's not that they are not likely to explore bhakti they may explore bhakti and if if they don't find us sectarian if they don't find us attacking what they presently believe or consider sacred then they will explore more and in many ways i think in three main ways i feel we offer more than many other organizations one is we offer quite systematic philosophical education we offer a uh, a program of very very sound sadhana and we also offer a lot of cultural social interpersonal engagement many temples are that way quite inactive you just go to the priest for some ritual so we can offer people so much more and then within that the particular philosophical confrontational point that is there that just gets sidelined automatically it doesn't really matter so much for them so sometimes just in trying to win that battle we may end up losing the war winning the battle of trying to prove that your view point is wrong we end up losing the war of getting the person to come closer to krishna yes manaj very true very true we have to be very sensitive to that especially when you do class preaching or if you are able to do that mm. you have to be very accommodative and very tolerant towards another person's opinion you see especially even in this in this uh, generation of people they don't like to be like you said spoken to from top down mm. they don't like to hear you because everybody has got a, a skewed up opinion about religion because of religious history especially in the west and also in india to some extent casteism and all that stuff together uh, they have got uh, you know a certain idea and they don't like to be told you know i am right you are wrong with that type of an attitude the scripture says this therefore it is right and you follow this nowadays i think the youngsters that type of a dialogue um, that type of a interaction doesn't fly very well uh, i can start sensing that amongst the newer generation yes so you, even to them you can't talk like you know do this because it says in the bhagavad gita so i do this because i am saying so i am a sanyasi and i am a saffron cloth monk uh, you know that doesn't work much nowadays yeah. but what you need to do is to actually fold your sleeves and get uh, friendly with them and uh, engage them and then gradually have them ask questions on their own and then you know sort of give them input sensitively yes ma'am so you you are right that uh, these things are to be observed yes, very correct. much you see the, this, this is what i mean by the postmodern climate uh, it may not be so prevalent some people may think in india but i think because of social media and all the stuff that uh, we have uh, people get to see all these things very fast and they imbibe them and sometimes inculcate them and they actually speak it out although they don't have that type of an experience fully but uh, you know they tend to become leftist very easily uh, yeah. nowadays it's it's like a more attractive thing to be speaking something different from a parent spoke and man's and my you know other ancestors think uh, you call that iconoclastic attitude scoffing yeah. at the tradition it seems to be some sort of and you have all these stand up comedians guys speaking about characters from mahabharata speaking about draupadi kunti and all that in a very derogatory fashion and there are all sorts of people sitting and laughing at the jokes i don't know what to call this but uh, that's a dangerous climate and in that type of climate if you go and tell them that bhagavad gita is like this and like that uh, you follow this it's not going to fly it's not going to fly mm. so i mean uh, the type of intrusion that western ideas and thoughts have made uh, into into the indian atmosphere in the ambience 
uh, because of they having appreciation for Western culture, other aspects of Western culture. And because of that uh, appreciation, they looking at our tradition and the great Indian tradition uh, in this way is something that needs strategy uh, and proper approach to address. It's very sensitive. Yes, Maharaj, that's true. I think, I think I'm making a subtle point. I don't know how to put it across, but I hope you understand. Yeah, you know, in many ways, today we can't presume authority. We have to earn authority. Mm. And exactly. you know, it's just because, as you said here, just because we are, we are monks or we are saffron, it's, or even if we are just representing a spiritual tradition, we don't have any authority just because of that. It is maybe by our exactly. cultural behavior, by our rational presentation, we slowly need to earn first, not even authority, first we need to earn credibility. And then authority will come. That, and so then, uh, so I think some statements where we offer, where Prabhupada is offering like sudden and clear judgment, that he is speaking to those who have accepted his authority. Like Prabhupada offers strong judgments about certain issues, that's to his disciples who have accepted his authority. And for in today's world, we actually earning that authority, it takes a lot of effort. And sometimes some people may just presume it and that completely backfires. So I think many people yeah. get a joy in like, what is the phrase in English? In uh, exposing the, there is a phrase like the, somebody who has feet of clay in pulling down, in showing, in pulling down authority. So having a non-confrontational attitude wherein we respect people for who they are and then gradually elevate them. That is the only approach that, that is likely to work in today's times. Yes, Maharaj. Maharaj, uh, yeah. this has been a very satisfying, very illuminating discussion. Can I, would you like to speak something concluding or I can sum, try to summarize what we discussed? You please summarize and then yeah. I'll say a few words. Okay, yes. So we tried to discuss about the history of outreach in India. And then you started by talking about your experiences in how you were introduced and how you saw uh, outreach taking a different turn in the 1990s with the establishment, not just of big temples, but also of reaching to the classes, educated kind of people. Then our main discussion today was about why or how we have become significantly successful in the last two decades as compared to before that. So I think we discussed three, four factors. One was that uh, we ourselves started focusing on doing educational outreach, which was, which is actually our distinctive strength. And by that we started attracting thoughtful people who could spread it further. Then secondly, also India's socio-economic changes made people more receptive toward the kind of spirituality that we are presenting where the mid, expanding middle class, they deal with the stresses and the disorder, the dislocation of urban life. They found our spirituality quite good. And third was that also as our devotees started going toward a more non-confrontational approach. So earlier we had that uh, becoming a devotee means moving into the temple. And it was more, I talked about rejection, complementation and improvement. So earlier it was more of a rejection approach and that worked in the West because the people there had already rejected material life. But in India, when you give your own example of how, because you were in a big family, it took some effort to come out of that. So we, we have now moved toward the complementation where we have lots of congregation devotees and they are also nourished and engaged. And this accommodating the congregation has enabled our movement to spread significantly and India is like the powerhouse. You also mentioned that as Indians, we have a responsibility to carry on Prabhupada's mission in the West also. Then we discussed about in India, uh, how successful are we right now? So we discussed about how 
we temples can be very powerful tools for outreach if they are used properly that means when people come to the temple there is someone to talk with them and uh, connect people to krishna and same with books also we distribute books but that is not an end in itself it is to help people appreciate devotees and then come closer to krishna so the inside out and the outside in approach and then you mentioned about with respect to our philosophy how we can offer the pyramid the soul god and uh, material nature how their connection can be offered and then that knowledge and that practice or this philosophy and its practice you mentioned the phrase value aided book distribution or value added book distribution so that was quite striking and then with respect to our outreach we need to look at the conversion ratio that we distribute books we build temples but we don't just want people to come as tourists so what resources are we offering and that pyramid example is beautiful at the bottom are people whom we reach then who appreciate then who start practicing something and then they become committed so outreach is not one zero like insider and outsider but it is more progressive so we need to engage and ele elevate everyone and i think we concluded with non confrontational approach in philosophical presentations like say whether it's evolution in the west or people's previous spiritual affiliations these those don't obstruct people as much as our criticism of those obstacles so in the post modern ethos we need to be sensitive especially with people who are thoughtful you now we have attracted intelligent people but we haven't attracted intellectual people and if you want to attract them then if we are more sensitive and respectful to people where they are then our outreach can expand substantially this much any other points or any wonderful 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 summary i mean how did he remember all these things <laughs> in a train <laughs> uh, good uh, following in memory well i all i wanted to say that uh, one thing is book distribution then temples then we make devotees but i think the challenge now is to sustenance of the devotees mm. giving them care building a community and uh, having them uh, inside a big family of a community that seems to be the focus nowadays the temples should turn into communities uh, i was asking a question from a community you said to a temple and i'm saying that for temples to survive they should be having a supportive community yeah. wherein the people who are dedicating themselves fully find their place securely and they can sort of settle down yeah i am you know i find myself as a square peg in a square hole i can find my square hole i'm a square peg beautiful <laughs> uh, that type of uh, this thing because a lot of them even if they are professionals they come and say they can't get proper engagement and therefore they stay away uh, we have to create that ambience and that whole atmosphere to sustain those people who have climbed the pyramid and come to the apex you know and not to be disappointed because at, at the apex a disappointment is extremely excruciating having gone to the apex is like you know thrown between the devil and the deep sea having come this far uh, so it's highly important that if you don't have this sustenance sustainability of the devotees and that ambience and that atmosphere so i think uh, the entire circuit will be closed when we are able to provide that type of high level care not only care for your emotional stuff and other thing care uh, on a level wherein you are very well placed and you have found your place like i said a square peg in the square hole maybe that will complete the whole temple structure that will complete the whole uh, preaching in india because india can afford that type of an atmosphere friendly wow. family uh, of people that you can afford it here better than in the west you can create that easier here so i think that's a great advantage and in india we should move towards creating huge communities and now that in this covid situation we can also learn that we should have uh, 
you know, auxiliary supporting structure of a farm and mm. uh, sustenance of a different type and everything. So the scope is so huge in India and you can go through a lot of things and achieve all those things that Prabhupada mentioned, uh, making use of the culture of the land and the great tradition and history. So Indian preaching has got a lot to do, apart from what I said that supporting the whole world's preaching also. So it's a big mandate that we can take on ourselves in India and uh, move towards it. It's exciting. And of course, there are challenges. Uh, and my own learning and understanding is, you know, still progressing. I wouldn't say that I've caught the, uh, you know, bull by the horns yet. But uh, it's a developing thing. It's in flux because the world, India is changing very rapidly. And therefore, we also have, also have to change our preaching strategies and uh, move ahead uh, with great, uh, you know, intelligent discussions and uh, strategies forward. It's the need of the hour. So I thank you very much for this dialogue. You brought out some very interesting analogies and, uh, you know, extracts from Prabhupada's life history and the history of our movement which I thought was very striking to me, especially the one you said about Darwin, uh, that the atheistic people are using Darwin's whole theory to uh, explain something that they would like to. That was a very uh, striking point and many such things. So thank you very much uh, for the opportunity for me to say a few things. I don't feel that I've said everything that I would want to say, but. Maybe uh, that's a more or less. Like then, we should come <laughs> again in the future and sometime we can continue this dialogue in future sometime, Maharaj, on some other subjects. This is a very interesting. It's a very interesting dialogue on outreach and how ISKCON should present itself to the world outside, especially in India. Uh, and I and I, I you know would be interested in exploring that further with you as very seasoned uh, gentleman who has been exposed to many different types of preaching atmospheres and outreach atmospheres. And I'm sure that uh, I will also learn a lot like I've done today. Yes. Thank you very much for calling me in. Uh, I'm sorry, I actually came today with a little uh, busy uh, schedule in the head from the morning. I was thinking of whether I'll be able to be present, but I thought of sort of settled in after some time to the topic it took me some time to settle down uh, but I no, hope that uh, very many profound thoughts as well as a lot of contemporary sharing of uh, your experiences personal as well as extended in the iskon world i felt it was a very illuminating discussion maharaj thank you very much for your time and your wisdom hare krishna hare, hare krishna, krishna. Hare